Welcome back to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. I'm Jim Hacking. And I'm Tyson Mutrix. What's up, Jimmy? Oh, Tyson, I'm laser focused. I've got my eye on the prize. We've got a big argument today. I'm excited about that. I'm also excited about our guest today. Uh, he is one of our good guild members, Bill Farias. But why don't you tell me how you're doing real quick before we get to Billy? Uh, I'm, I'm doing great. I was telling Bill that we, we've got a little bit of rain for my garden. I'm excited about it. I, I, I've got a, I got this new hobby. I mean, we've already always gardened, but like, I'm really into it this year. We watched a ma that master class um, uh, by Ron Finley. And so if you've not seen it yet, Jimmy, if you, I don't know if you do any gardening, gardening at all, but it's really, it's entertaining at, the, at a minimum. Man, we're getting old. Last week I was excited about a new bed and you're excited about gardening. <laughs> And just for the record, anything that involves sweat, grass, or mud, I have no interest in, as we evidenced by our hay bale discussion last week. That's true. Well, Amy, Amy has not let me mow the lawn for like the last two years. She's hired someone. And so I, I don't get my fix on the lawnmower anymore. So when I'm gardening, I get to drive the little lawnmower around carrying my stuff around. It's, it's my excitement on the weekends. I like it. It's fun. Well, let's get to it. Billy, how you doing, man? I'm doing great, guys. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be on the show. Uh, I, am, I am also the opposite of a, a green thumb. Uh, I cannot do gardening at all, so it would, it would not look pretty if I tried to go out and improve my garden. <laughs> well, well, okay. Well, you all, you all have your black thumbs. It's, it, let, me, let me just say this. If you've got Masterclass, just watch that video. It, it might get you excited in gardening. I'm just telling you. It's really good. Okay. It's like, it's like an hour. It's the little things these days. I agree. That's right. All right. So, so Bill, tell us a little bit about, like, for, for people that don't know you, you, Jim and I know you really, really well now, but for those that don't know you, tell, tell people your journey, your story, how do you, how you get to where you are now? Yeah. So uh, I am uh, the son of immigrant parents. Um, they are um, career factory workers. They're retired now. Uh, they taught me uh, the value of consistency, uh, reliability, integrity. Uh, they fostered my uh, love for sports. I was a sports kid growing up, played a lot of hockey. Uh, they were very supportive. I remember being very intensely competitive as a kid, um, more so than um, a lot of my peers. Um, Going into undergrad, I really didn't have uh, much direction, which I don't think is unusual, but I had no idea what I wanted to do. Uh, so I majored in having fun. Um, I went to uh, what we call the zoo, UMass, and uh, it was a lot of fun, but really didn't know what I wanted to do for a living. So I did casework for a while coming out of uh, undergrad but it wasn't feeding my competitive drive. Uh, at that point, I'm slowing down in sports, which unfortunately uh, happens uh, to everyone. So um, I'm thinking, how can I compete long-term? And that's uh, the point at which trial work uh, became interesting and fascinating to me because I was thinking, well, here's something I can do for a living and get paid and compete because I know I wasn't gonna be a pro athlete. So I start consuming everything I, I can get my hands on, on uh, trial work, and then I'm on my uh, path to law school. So I start law school. Unfortunately, I very quickly fell flat on my face uh, in law school. I was, I guess the best way to put it is burning the candle at both ends. Uh, wasn't taking care of myself at all, uh, personally. And I think a lot of that comes from my competitive drive, right? So everything I do, I do 1000%. Um, and I approach law school the same way, just every waking hour, that's all I did. Uh, wasn't sleeping, just generally not caring for myself. And that snowballed into some pretty intense uh, insomnia and, and sort of a, a downward psychological uh, spiral. And it got to the point that I really, I couldn't function. So I couldn't think. Um, and I was at a crossroads. I had to decide what I was going to do. And I had to take some time off um, from law school. And I remember uh, 
feeling defeated at the time and embarrassed, right? It was the first time in my life that I put my mind to something and I felt like I failed. So uh, that was a very difficult time for me. So I had to go to uh, the administrators and tell them uh, what was going on. They were very supportive. They said, you know, we're going to hold your slot and you do what you need to do to uh, take care of yourself and let us know if you want to come back. So at that point, I wasn't really sure. I was filled with doubt. I wasn't sure that I wanted to go back. You know, the thoughts start going through my head. Uh, is this something I can even handle? Do I want to do this? Um, but uh, the, you know, I got myself some quality help, saw uh, a cognitive behavioral therapist, read a lot on psychology, learned about personal well-being, uh, regrouped, uh, went back and uh, got my law school degree. At that point, my goal was to become a, a criminal defense attorney. And uh, my thought was that the best uh, path was to prosecute for a couple of years. Got a ton of trial experience in court every day, uh, every working day, trying cases, you know, in front of uh, juries, judges, just really getting comfortable on my feet. And uh, from there, so I did that for two years. And then I started my own practice, uh, was mainly doing criminal work at the outset. Uh, but at some point started taking family law cases, uh, became more interested in family law and uh, eventually transitioned to doing mainly family law. So now uh, we have a small firm in Southeastern Mass. Uh, there are three of us, myself and two other employees. And uh, I'm really excited about the future, planning to grow. Bill, talk to us a little bit about uh making that transition away from criminal law? How has that been and how has your mindset been going through that? It has been, um, it, it's been great um, in the sense that I can now devote all of my attention to what's really important to me and what's really going to help me take it to the next level. Uh, I felt like criminal law was my safety net. I mean, I did it for so long uh, that I felt like to, to let go of it was a big risk. And uh, that's something that I've really worked on in terms of my mindset is uh, taking on more calculated risks. So for a while, I just wasn't open to doing it. Um, I think the, the Guild uh, was very helpful in helping me develop a mindset to make that leap. Uh, and I knew that, I think what was most difficult for me was I knew that I had to take a step back financially, at least short term, to, to make that leap. Uh, I do believe that niching down is the way to go. Um, so once I focused on family law, it was really a matter of digging up the courage uh, to make that transition. And then it was a matter of just doing it. Just uh, went out there, announced it. Here's what I'm going to do. And uh, now... I have a few cases left, but I'm, I'm going to uh, close those out. And uh, it's in the rearview mirror, and I'm really excited for what's ahead. I enjoyed criminal law, uh, but I, I'm more interested in family law, and, and I think it's a better fit, especially for what I'm trying to do in, in growing a firm, um, at least in terms of where my interests lie. You know, Bill, you made a really good point, because you do have this short-term pain, but long-term gain whenever you, you decide to to niche down and get rid of one of your practice areas. It, it is painful at first, but once you get past that, it is very beneficial for your firm. But I want to, I want to step back as well. Though. I want to ask you about how much of your story do you incorporate into your marketing? Because I think you've got a really interesting story that would relate to people that are going through a very stressful situation. So how much of that do you incorporate into your marketing? Good uh, question. She, none. And uh, that's something that I have to work on. Uh, I think I need to certainly uh, develop my, my marketing skills. I mean, I have the, you know, the fundamentals. Uh, I, um, you know, my eyes were um, opened and, and a whole new world uh, opened up to me when I started consuming Ben Glass and Dan Kennedy um, in around 2015. Um, so I'm doing the basics. I'm putting out content. Uh, but I think uh, once I, um, sort of solidify, solidify my foundation in terms of my operations, which is my focus right now, that I really need to uh, think uh, about my marketing and come up with a plan. And I think that 
that's something that I certainly need to do more of. So the answer is zero. There's none of my personal story in my marketing. Bill, uh, we had a chat a few weeks ago and you after that did a Colby and I know that on your Colby report that it came back that you're a high fact finder and, and listening to your story this morning, I can see it because you said that before, you know, when you were finishing up college, before you went to law school, you did a real deep read on trial and, and legal work. And then um, when you um, had that situation in law school where you needed to take a step back, you said you did a lot of reading on uh, psychology and working with a therapist. Talk to us a little bit about what your approach is to reading so as to up your skills. So I am a, um, I, I am a firm believer in making time every single day to uh, consume knowledge. So uh, before I tackle any work every single day, I consume about half hour of reading on a number of different topics. A lot of it, uh, business development, uh, personal development. And, um, you know, I came on to this um, a, a few years back when I started learning that a common denominator among very successful people was that, or is that they consume knowledge regularly. Uh, they, they don't really take time off. They, they are constantly in improvement mode, self-improvement self mode, both personally and as business people. Um, and so I just decided that that was a habit I was going to incorporate. And so I, I sort of bookend my days, no, no pun in, intended. I start with half hour of reading and I finish my day uh, with consuming a little more knowledge uh, before bed, usually more personal uh, at that point to kind of wind down. Uh, but it's something that I've incorporated into my routine. And so now it's second nature. So Bill, you, you said a few things that sort of, you know, I don't know, they pinged with me. I, I, I kind of, I, I noticed some differences in things that you're doing now as opposed to a year ago. And so over the last year, what are some things, I mean, how have you changed? How have you changed your practice over the last year that have, that have helped you I guess, make more money, but also help clients, um, improve your efficiency, things like that. So I think it's best to probably step back to, to explain what, what I see as my evolution as an attorney and as a firm owner. So I think of my career as having three phases. So the first phase was I was intensely focused on being the best lawyer I could possibly be. And so I did that for a stretch and just went out and got as much practice as I could and read, consumed everything I could on that subject. The next phase, which I spoke about briefly, was when I learned about marketing, which was about in 2015. And it was at that point that I learned that you have control over your financial destiny, that you don't have to do it. I'll call it the old school way of just going out and working hard and relying only on word of mouth to build your business. And then the next phase, uh, which is the phase I'm in now, started probably about two, three years ago when I started to view myself as a CEO and firm owner. Um, and that was really a, a breakthrough because it allowed me to kind of step back and look down on my business from a 10,000 foot view and understand that there are all of these components that I'm in charge of, uh, marketing, systems development, and one of the most important that I'm focusing on now is, is staff development, right? So now I am a coach, I am a manager, uh, and I'm doing my best to uh, develop my staff, to create a system uh, that allows us to all grow together and learn together. So my perspective is, is really, changed in that regard and uh i'm working on freeing up more time every day and it, it's going to be a, a gradual process but freeing up more time every day to focus on uh, those tasks and responsibilities what do you enjoy most about this current phase that you're in 
I enjoy, and, and this goes back to what we talked about, Jimmy. I, I did the, uh, the Colby and I didn't really dig into the numbers and what they mean, but I remember after having that conversation with you going into the Colby, hoping that I was going to be a visionary, right? Because it's Steve Jobs that gets all the, the, the attention and, and hype and uh, that's the cool thing, right? Not many people know about Wozniak and, and what he did at Apple. Um, but it turns out that the numbers indicate that I'm more of an integrator. And that makes sense because I do enjoy the nuts and bolts of putting together plans, uh, sort of being the engineer of the firm, right? Taking a look at the different systems, what needs tweaking, what needs improvement. Uh, so I do enjoy that a lot. I do also enjoy the marketing and I enjoy the, uh, the you know, the long-term planning and, uh, and building that. Uh, but, but I do think that I'm a little bit more of a hands-on person in the sense of actively working on improving the business. I am getting better at uh, delegating. That's something that I really struggle with uh, a while back. I, I guess you can say I was sort of a control freak. Uh, but it, it, I think after shifting into this phase that I'm in now, I learned that there is absolutely no way that you're going to be able to scale a firm uh, by being a control freak. And so uh, I'm very comfortable now delegating and trying to do more of that. So I think I'm best at running the operation. So Bill, I do want to kind of try to get down into some things that you said you had some struggles with. And, and one of the things you said you have struggles with is diversifying marketing. Wait, can you tell us what you mean by that? Yeah. So what I mean is that uh, I'm a big fan of Content Inc. So I read Content Inc. Uh, a while back and uh, it, it's a great resource uh, for anyone who hasn't read it. And so I've been focused mainly on written content. So I've been doing that for years. I shifted uh, my focus for a while on creating some video, uh, but that was a very short period of time. And so essentially, I'm relying solely on my written content and my SEO, which I think is pretty strong overall. Uh, but I believe in diversification in the sense of I, I don't think that I should be relying only on my um, Google local and general SEO. I think I can do a better job of, uh, for example, um, I need a newsletter. So that's something I'm working on. I'm working on creating a newsletter. I currently don't have uh, an after unit, right? So I'm working on building that. Uh, and I think the, the newsletter is going to be uh, a big part of that. I think another thing that I can work on is, Jim, you and I had a, a brief talk about this at Max Law 19 uh, about networking, right? And the power of networking. And, and we know that John Fisher um, is great at networking and, and a big proponent and uh, many uh, fellow Max Law members uh, believe in it. I have not networked um, at all. Uh, so I think that maybe the right answer is, so maybe it's not going to a BNI group every single week or doing a lunch every single day, but maybe it's more targeted networking. Um, and I'm just thinking out loud, just trying to pick uh, certain individuals who, who, first of all, you can help, um, who you can use to sort of create a, a service hub uh, where people come in, they have a problem, you have someone reliable you can refer them to. Um, and, you know, maybe at some point down the line, you get some business from that. So uh, that's another area that I've been giving a lot of thought to. Um, so generally, I just think I need to be diversified. I think I have all my eggs in one basket, and I'm not sure that that's the best approach. So I'll ask Tyson a question. But for me, Bill, uh, there is no practice area that we refer out more than family law. I have a, I only have one lawyer's cards here, Steve Bartle in the office. And when we get a family family issue, which I literally is at least once a week, we refer a case to Steve. So I, I don't know about you, Tyson, but for me, um, family law 
if there's if there's someone I know who's good at it, who enjoys it, who doesn't view it as a grind, and knows what they're doing, um, I'm happy to refer them. So I think networking in your particular field would be helpful. Tyson, what do you think? I I, I completely agree. I mean, I there there is not a case that I refer more than family law cases, and I and I'm sure that you know the majority of those are just a total pain in the ass because I I can't imagine wanting to ever do a family law case, but I I. I'm, just, I'm with you, Jim. I mean, we probably get one every other day at a minimum of people calling or something through the website. It is, it's crazy. So I think picking lawyers is a smart idea. I think if you've not been networking, I think you're probably missing out, honestly. So I think you should start targeting. And I think your idea of targeting specific people is really, 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 really clever. I mean, I have a top 20 list and a top 200 list. And, all, and I think Jim has something very similar. It's just, he just calls them different things where we target these people with specific things. And I think you should do the exact same thing. I will also say this though, um, cracking the relationship at this, at this stage in your career is difficult because Jim already has referral partners. I already have referral partners that I trust and that I like. So you need to be smart about cracking that because you're going to go to some people, they'll never refer to you. They just will never, because they've already got their people. So maybe targeting younger lawyers could be the right way. Because I've thought about this a little bit. Targeting younger lawyers, maybe as, as young as law school, because they don't ha quite have those referral partners yet. You want to get them early so that you, you can get them to regularly refer to you. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And along the lines of what you guys said, I think family law is that practice area that many attorneys just don't want to do. I mean, even general practitioners who practice threshold law and, and take everything uh, exclude family law. So I, I think it's a great opportunity and it's definitely something that I need to develop a plan for and execute. And I, I, I'll, I'll push back a little bit on what Tyson said. I, I love Steve Bartle, but if some young upstart who I like um, said, I want to do some family law, can I need some cases, I would probably be a little sympathy for him and try to dole it out a little evenly. No offense, Steve, but you know, I think that if you can find people who aren't, you know, generalists who don't ever touch family. And like you said, don't want to touch it. I think that just being sort of systematic about it, like Tyson said, I mean, if you think about all the heavy hitters who spend all that money on public um, personal injury cases, if you could just become friends with them, you know, they're getting referrals for other things other than car accidents. So just becoming friends with them, would be um, good. And of course, if you're just doing family and they know you're not gonna steal their PI case, then it's gonna be much more of a free flow of cases your way. Yeah, absolutely. I think I, I need to do that uh, to take this to the next level. Steve, you're still my guy, man. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna cheat on you. You're still mine. Um, so tell us, what, what else? I asked you what you struggle with when it comes to marketing, but other than that, I mean, I feel like you're in a really good place right now. I mean, I can, I mean, I, I don't know about you, Jim. I know there's a significant difference between you now and you a year ago. So um, is there something else that you're struggling with now that we just don't see? Um, I don't think so. I, I think I was very fortunate uh, to, to be in a good position to move through this pandemic and recession. Um, you know, I had uh, saved up a, a decent amount and was sort of expecting a downturn in, in the economy. So I was already in the mode of sort of solidifying the foundation and I, I wasn't really focused on growth for right now. So I feel like that has a, a lot to do with it. So when this hit, my mentality and my mindset was, I mean, obviously no one wants a pandemic, but my mindset was, I was already in this mode anyway. This is just going to give me more time to work on my business. So um, I, I think that that's, uh, that's pretty much it. I mean, I do struggle with, uh, with the marketing. I am getting better at managing. Uh, again, I only have two employees at this point, so I'm relatively new to this. Uh, so I'm trying to learn as much as I can on that, I think Radical Candor is a, is a great resource for that, for creating a system uh, uh, of being open and honest, but still caring with one another. So we challenge each other. Uh, so, I mean, there are challenges day to day, uh, but 
um, in terms of something that's holding me back, um, I, I agree that I've come a long way in the last year or two. And I think a lot of it was just being comfortable with uh, fear and, and understanding fear. And I think it's Seth Godin who, who says, uh, you have to dance with fear, right? Whereas before it was holding me back and I was just thinking, well, I'm gonna take on all this overhead and this is gonna be so difficult. And what if things go wrong? Uh, but you have to learn to, uh, you know, if you did the work and you're doing the work and you're getting better, uh, you have to trust that you're going to be okay, that you will uh, suffer some setbacks, uh, but to treat those as learning opportunities and, uh, and move on. So I think most importantly, it's been the mindset shift uh, that's helped me the most and to not view uh, adversity as the ap apocalypse, but rather using it as an opportunity to improve the firm. I remember you were one of the first people to go on the hot seat in the OG guild. And I remember, and, and you know, what's, what's said in the guild sort of stays in the guild, but I just remember broadly you pushing back on, on hiring somebody. I remember that, um, how that was such a big deal for you. So you have indeed come a long way, but I want to shift gears for a minute. Um, you, you have been a great student of marketing. And if you're reading things like Seth Godin and Dan Kennedy and content Inc, I, I'm wondering, Bill, what, uh, what do you think was your biggest misconception about marketing and what have you learned about marketing that really helped you the most? Um, my, my misconception uh, about marketing, that's a difficult one. I'll, I'll have to come back to that. But in terms of what's most helpful, I think it's sort of speaking the clients uh, or the, the potential clients language and meeting them where they're at and making uh, and designing your marketing so that it's about them and their pain points. Uh, so th that's really, I think, the key. Um, I, I think it's pretty common knowledge at this point that no one wants to hear about you and your credentials and um, what you did and how successful you are. They don't care. They just want their questions answered. Uh, and so, I try to focus on that, try to think of uh, the, the potential client, put myself in their shoes and ask myself, what are they worried about? What questions are they asking? What information do they need? And develop the content uh, that way. So in terms of misconceptions, um, I mean, I really don't know. I, I really can't think of a, a misconception. Like I said, it, it was a few years ago that I started learning about this stuff. I thought Dan, Dan Kennedy's material was awesome. Uh, he, he's not for everyone, uh, but a great resource. And uh, I learned a lot from that. So that's what I'm trying to focus on is focus on the client's needs, wants, and um, designing my marketing accordingly. Bill, it might be common knowledge to the people in Maximum Lawyer, but it is not common knowledge to most lawyers. If you Google, I, I was actually trying to Google uh, Massachusetts, Massachusetts family law attorney. I, I want to see what the advertising was like, because I guarantee it's all about them. It's not about the clients, the vast majority of it. So you're doing a really good job. And I even on your website, you've got the banner that says, hey, we're open. We use email, phone, text and video conferencing to serve our clients remotely. Learn more. I think it's really smart. Uh, I, I'm probably going to steal that idea, that ribbon across the top, because I think it's it's really effective. It's in red. It's 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 nice. But all that being said, we do have to wrap things up. Um, cause Jim does have a really, really big hearing today. So good luck, Jimmy. Um, but I'm going to wrap things up before I do want to remind everyone, go to the Facebook group, uh, get involved there. Uh, I want to say hello to the guild members that are watching live right now. If you're interested in the guild, reach out to us, max maximumlawyer.com. Um, and if you don't mind, just take a couple seconds as you're listening to the rest of this episode to give us a five-star review. Jimmy, what's your hack of the week? When Bill was talking about Content Inc., I remember how much I liked those books by Joe Paluzzi and uh, those Content Inc. guys are really good. Definitely worth following. Um, they have solid emails every day. But it also reminded me of a fellow that we've talked about on the show named Mark Schaefer, uh, who I was introduced to by Mitch Jackson. And he has a couple books along the same lines as the Content Inc. guys, including The Content Code. And my favorite one is called Known, K-N-O-W-N. It's a great book. So anybody who's looking to get into more content marketing or to develop their voice 
like Bill was saying, um, anything by Mark Schaefer would be very helpful. Good stuff. All right, Bill, you know the routine by now. So what is your tip or hack of the week? So my recommendation is a book called The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. Uh, I'm a big fan of routine, uh, both personal and in business. I think that's really the key, right? I mean, everyone can come up with this idea or do something here and there, uh, but you are the, the sum of what you do day in and day out. And it turns out it's not that easy to break bad habits and implement good habits and to do that consistently. So this book, The Power of Habit, basically gives you the science behind habit formation, and it literally gives you a blueprint for hacking habits. So I think it's a great resource, again, both for personal life and for business. Very good stuff. Uh, so for those of you that have been listening for the last few episodes, you've heard me talk about you know sharpening the, 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 the knife or, or the sword or whatever, however I put it, sharpening the blade. The saw. Uh, the saw, sharpening the saw, getting smarter. <laughs> um, but uh, studying and, and training up and, and making sure that your skills don't diminish. Um, I found, and a lot of you PI lawyers may already know about this, but there's something called case analysis. And they've been doing free webinars for the last month. And I've just been binging on those. And the, they had some last week and this week. They were just truly amazing. And some of these just amazing trial lawyers that have been putting on these presentations and giving, I mean, I'm talking about opening the playbook, opening the full playbook. And it, it was, it's, it's, it's actually kind of, it was mind blowing the other day whenever I was watching one on crossing defense experts. So um, check out case analysis. It's really freaking awesome. I think it's by um, the Trojan horse people that are doing um, they're, they're kind of trying to replicate the reptile stuff. And if you do personal injury, you know what I'm talking about. But if you want to sharpen your trial skills, even if you're talking about just, if, if you, even if you don't do jury trials, I highly recommend it. All right, Bill, thanks so much, man, for coming on. It's been way too long. We appreciate it. And I, I've learned a lot. Thank you, guys. Good luck, Jimmy. Thanks, brother. See you guys. Good luck, Jim. See ya. See ya.